If you've played any Bannerlord campaign, you'll notice at least two things. Durthurt is a complete and Sturgia gets stomped 100% of the time. While I can't do much about the old dirtbag, I do have some ideas to help out those shieldy boys to the north. In this video, we'll be looking at the best army formations and tactics I could come up with when playing as Sturgia against all other factions. Not only will we look at the actual battles, but afterwards we'll break down which units performed well and which did not. There's a ton of info to get to, so let's get right to work. Starting with old D-Bag himself, Vlandio. To set up these tests, we form an army using only noble parties and finding comparable battles with the enemy. To get a baseline, we first run the test by letting the AI take control of the battle. As you can see, they're fond of the traditional tactics. F1, F3. The cavalry are outnumbered 5 to 1, but that doesn't matter. Charge right in. Infantry lumber in slowly, and within a minute, the battle's over. It's not pretty, but it got the job done. Now we reload the exact battle and take control of our units this time. We already know the Vlandians will have a huge advantage in ranged and cavalry troops, but we hold the advantage in infantry. To make the most of our advantage, we split the infantry into four equally sized groups. We also split the archers into two groups and keep all of our melee cavalry in a single unified group. I ran this battle many times, and this formation is the best I could come up with. Four independent shield squares up front, two loose formation archers behind them, and cavalry in the rear held as reserves. Rather than data dumping everything at once, let's watch the battle play out so I can explain as we go why this setup is being used. We move up slowly, keeping the formation intact in case the enemy cavalry decides to charge. As we get into range of the enemy crossbows, we slow down the advance and soak up the enemy missiles. This will accomplish two things. Stationary shield walls are much harder to penetrate giggity 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 goo since there's no gaps and we are far enough distance away that any hits that land will be much weaker than up close. Losing a couple troops here and there isn't cause for panic. Just hold steady and let them run low on bolts. For this phase, it might make sense to change to shield wall instead of square, but prepare to square up if the enemy charges with cavalry. They've all but run out of ammo on the higher tier, long range units, and it's time to square up and push forward again. They snuck up some cavalry on our archers, which we can repel with our own cavalry. Having the shield square spread out more or archers condensed more helps to avoid this. Placing our cavalry right behind our archers allows for two advantages. The archers can still shoot arrows and the cavalry will stop the enemy in their tracks leading to easy kills. It sacrifices some archers in the process, but devastates the enemy cavalry. It's so satisfying to watch squares in action against cav. Okay, now it's our turn. We move up, holding the same formation. At this range and elevation difference, it's best to hold fire with the archers and conserve ammunition. F4 is the default hold fire command, which apparently I forgot to do. We've moved up enough to entice the enemy cavalry to charge. Because their charge is uphill, the damage received is reduced significantly. We rush our reserve cavalry to help support our right flank square. There's no point in chasing the enemy, so we place our cavalry just inside the square formation and put them on shield wall, allowing them to stop the cavalry in their tracks and dish out tons of damage at the same time. Notice how few units we lose with each charge. Square for infantry and shield wall for cavalry is heavily favored against cavalry in line charge, even when outnumbered and outmatched. Unfortunately, the AI keeps cycling back and forth mindlessly, and we hold firm, taking favorable exchanges. Now both enemy cavalry groups charge, but they can't break our squares. The right flank attacks cease, so we move our reserve cavalry to the left to help out. The back and forth repeats and we repel each charge with vigor. The action dies off a bit, so we creep forward, trying to bait the enemy infantry into combat. One quick note, if the enemy cavalry do reach your archer lines, it's best to give the archers the charge command. This will result in more aggressive targeting, and more importantly, they will switch to melee mode more frequently and gang up on the cavalry that get bogged down. Once the cavalry are gone, be sure to move them back into position. Now it's time for the final push. We consolidate our infantry on the ridge and push closely together. This is important when infantry battles are imminent. Having them spread out would be a huge mistake. They make the fatal error and charge into our lines. We switch all infantry formations to shield wall and order the charge. Our archers and javelin cavalry are out of ammunition as well, so we send them in. The bigger the numbers advantage we have, the less troops we will lose overall. So don't hesitate to hold fire with archers and send them in. Their main line collapses easily, but they have reinforcements coming. It's a mistake to chase them with a disorganized line. So we pull everyone back to reset. It's mostly recruits left at this point, so we shield wall charge them into oblivion. Wow, look at that beautiful heart shape Dirth made for us. It's almost impossible to get a good picture of how the battle went from this screen. Troops are all over the place, but we can see a significant drop in losses when we took command of the battlefield. To understand why, we need to look closely at some data. To help with this, I created an army composition database that I plan on making public in the near future. Its purpose is to catalog all of the troops in the battlefield and calculate the total wages for both sides, KDR, and several other interesting metrics. Let's start by analyzing the enemy side first, starting with the melee infantry. I know there's a lot to look at here, but we'll only focus on KDR to keep things simple. Looking down the first 
first list, most units have a KDR well below 1, which means they lose more units than they kill. These footmen, which make up the largest group within the infantry, mostly fall between 0.4 and 0.5. Looking at the infantry as a whole, we see 239 kills to 391 losses, or a 0.6 KDR. Clearly, the infantry aren't pulling their own weight, which means other groups will need to pick up the slack or they'll lose. Now, if we switch over to the player control data, we see much more grim picture. KDRs have fallen across the board, some going as low as 0.06. Let me know in the comments if you want me to do another video covering some of these other numbers, like dinars per kill. It's really interesting stuff, but outside the scope of this guide. Moving on, let's look at shock troop stats. With the AI in control, their billmen and Volger did quite a good job overall, earning 41 kills and only losing 27 or a 1.5 KDR overall. Once we took command, that changes to 19 kills and 28 losses or a 0.6 KDR. I thought for sure the crossbow would do a better job, but it doesn't seem to be the case. Oddly enough, the tier 2 levy crossbowmen did as good a job as their tier 3 crossbowmen and only slightly worse than the tier 5 sharpshooters. The overall KDR was 0.5, which is even lower than the infantry. The numbers drop again for the player controlled battle, but not as much as I would have liked to see, still earning 0.34 KDR overall. And finally, for Valandia's greatest strength, their cavalry. Except when we look at these numbers, we see some very sobering results. Not a single group went above 1 KDR, and the overall was 0.34, which is the lowest of all four groups. Brace yourselves for something truly disgusting next. The player controlled stats are off the charts bad, with 200 plus cavalry units not even managing to crack 10 kills in total. The KDR comes to 0.04. Part of these results come from the bad cavalry AI, some from bad commander AI, and some from our superior square formations with cavalry reinforcements. Now let's shift and look at our own side. I've broken each unit up into their own groups so we can more easily see which ones are pulling their own weight. The tier 2 warrior performed about the same in regards to kills for both tests, but player controlled suffered significantly less casualties, increasing KDR from 1.2 up to 2.8. Sturgis lower tier infantry get a bad rap. They perform well if given the right formations and commands. Now for the tier 3 brigand, a unit I used to personally hate. Under the AI's control, they managed a measly 0.7 KDR. Under the player control, that shoots up to 2.4, which is a massive increase. These units are incredibly vulnerable, but if used defensively, they can perform quite well. As expected, the tier 4 spearmen perform even better. 1.6 KDR under AI control and 4.7 under the player's guidance. But the two units I was most curious about, the tier 5 infantry. The big question has always been, Heavy Spearmen or Heavy Axemen? Let's look at the data to find out. Under AI control, they rack up 290 kills in total and 76 losses for a 3.8 KDR. Under the player control, the kills drop to 266, but deaths plummet to only 21, or a 12.6 KDR. Let's compare this to the heavy Axemen. While Axemen only made up about 35% of the numbers that the Spearman numbers made up, the KDR should still be relevant here. AI controlled ended up with 99 kills and 37 deaths for a KDR of 2.6, and under the player's control, that KDR comes up to 8.5. Heavy Spearmen are a better unit, clearly. Okay, I'm joking. This is a small sample size for starters, and it's against a cavalry heavy Vlandian army. We'll see later how they hold up against other army compositions. Let's speed this up a bit since we have a lot to cover. Archers under AI control earn a few more kills but got completely wiped out. Under player management, they survived and earned a KDR of 8. We see a similar result for the tier 3 hunters with the AI sacrificing all of them, but the player surviving to earn 6.7 KDR. If you were curious how badly the Sturgeon cavalry were, don't worry, I got you covered. Under AI control, they managed a 0.4 KDR and oddly enough, only a 0.3 KDR under the player's command. The main reason for this is they were used as body blockers for the enemy cavalry, so the infantry and square formations could strike them down. So their KDR is mostly pointless for our purposes. Moving forward for the rest of the guide, we'll be keeping the data to a bare minimum, otherwise the video would drag on for over an hour. I'm going to make these databases for all battles shown here available on the Discord in case anybody wants to deep dive and geek out like I did. The last battle was an even balance of power, but I wanted to see how good the Sturgeon tactic can be. So we lowered our army size by 120 troops and fought the battle again. We already know the AI will perform much worse than the player, so we'll skip that. I fully expected the AI to push since they had the power advantage, but they sat back and we had to abandon our beautiful hill position positioning and push forward. There's a slight slope going from our left flank down to the right, so we reposition ourselves to take the high ground. While we don't have many archers to take advantage of the hill, it will reduce the sting from their crossbows a bit. Once again, their cavalry charges recklessly into our square formation and takes significant casualties. The first lesson to learn here, don't keep your archers too far behind the shield wall or the cavalry will have free reign. Instead, we move them just behind our infantry and give the charge command. Not long after, their first cavalry group is completely destroyed. Once again, we creep up to their line 
lines and they send their second cavalry group in. We hold our ground and pick off their cavalry in droves. Soon after they send their infantry in and we once again give the shield wall and charge commands. The fight doesn't last long and we regroup once more to handle their reinforcements. It's a complete stomp with only 171 losses this time around. Most units on our side earn 3.5 to 4 KDR each, which is incredible for low tier units. But the real fireworks are with the heavies. The spearmen killed 198 and only lost 16 for a 12.3 KDR, which is remarkably close to the previous test. Heavy Axemen killed 140 with only 10 losses, or 14 KDR, which is significantly higher than the previous 8.5. I'm glad to see them make a comeback on this one. For the next test, I decided to raise the stakes a little. Almost a thousand Sturgeons versus 1250 Empire troops. Once again, we start with four groups of infantry on the front line, spaced out just a little bit. The enemy open up from their max range, and we move into shield wall to soak up their arrows. Once they run dry, we push up nice and slow, holding the square formation for the inevitable cavalry charge that will come. We don't have to wait long. Empire cavalry are incredibly tanky, so killing them off takes a bit more time than the Vlandians did. Again, we move our cavalry inside the square formation to provide more stopping power, allowing our infantry tree to take them out. Time to move up. This time we try slightly overlapping square formations. Luckily the AI ran out of arrows and their archers are sitting ducks for our archers. Gotta love that Bannerlord AI. With most of our archers out of arrows, it's time to continue the push. I'm not sure why the AI is just standing there. Even if they all charge, they would get crushed, so I guess it doesn't really matter. There's something so satisfying to watch our four squares move up and swallow the enemy formations. I also experimented with surrounding the enemies in little pockets. It kind of works. The enemy cavalry are having no problem breaching our squares, so having deeper squares would have helped in this case. Cavalry also provide a good solution to this problem. We slowly move up to aggro them into our squares and then shift over to shield while charging. Once again, we get our archers into the melee as well with the charge command. The more bodies we have in the mix, the better results we'll have. Keep in mind, they had a huge 300 troop advantage and the balance of power was heavily in their favor. Looking at the full army composition, we see a total army wage for our side at just shy of 5,000 dinars, and the enemy empire costing nearly 6,000 dinars. Before we check on our beloved heavies, let's take a quick look at the Empire Cavalry. Their performance is quite bad. Even the Cataphracts failed to reach 0.5 KDR, and the Cavalry as a whole barely above 0.1. It might be time to stop using Cavalry altogether. Okay, maybe that's not true. Our own Cav managed 30 kills to only 18 deaths, or a 1.6 KDR. It's still not good compared to our other units, but at least it's above 1. I also wanted to point one thing out. Sturgius Archers get a lot of heat for being bad, which they are. I'm certainly not disagreeing with that, but they can still provide incredible value when used properly. Properly. Our archers as a whole earned nearly 10 KDR, killed over 300 with a small force of 127, the majority of which are tier 3 units. Like the ladies say, it's about how you use it that counts. And finally, let's look at the heavies to see which one's on top. Heavy spearmen slide a bit this round. 367 kills to 53 deaths, or a KDR of 6.9, a drop of nearly 50% from the last fight. I suspect the Empire infantry provide a tougher challenge for spearmen than Vlandian. Looking at the heavy axemen, we see a solid showing. 231 kills to 24 deaths, or a 9.6 KDR. It seems spearmen excel against cavalry heavy cultures, while axemen perform well against infantry heavy cultures. We'll see if that holds up as we continue. Now for the mortal enemy of all Sturgeons, the Kazate. This time we take 425 versus 598, and an even bigger balance of power deficit. I already know this is going to be a hot button battle, so I let the AI run the battle just to show it's a complete stomp. They lose very badly. First, we need to address the horse archer problem. We create an outer square using our infantry squares to shield the loose formation archers on the inside. The formation seems to confuse the AI, and they half run through our infantry and half stop on the outside, providing the perfect opportunity to counter charge with our own javelin cavalry. They decide to retreat and regroup, running right through our giant formation. With barely over 50 archers in total, we're holding our own against their 150, thanks to the infantry squares. This process repeats a couple more times until we decide to cut off their retreat with our own cavalry, eliminating the horse archer threat for good. At this point, you probably know what's coming next. The Squares of Doom march onward, ready to swallow these menacing Kazate hordes in an instant. As we close in, some of their cavalry are drawn in but are cut down quickly. They don't have the survivability that the Empire cavalry had. They don't seem keen to attack no matter how close we get, so we send three of the four squares in and hold one in reserve to help fend off incoming cavalry. When they don't come, we use our cavalry to protect the archers instead and move the infantry up to gain a rear flank. Once again we come out with a victory, overcoming a huge deficit power. 597 kills and only 
185 losses. Let's start with the enemy's horse archer stats. They barely managed 23 kills but sustained 159 casualties. Part of the problem was the AI bugging out and running through our lines, but I think our formation could have held against all the incoming arrows without taking massive casualties. To make sure this is the case, I ran a custom battle using equal numbers and four squares. The infantry held strong until the very end, barely being beat by the horse archers. In reality, we would have foot archers to help support from the inside, and horse archer numbers would be much smaller than our infantry numbers, so I'm confident with this structure. Our own archers did a nice job, 92 kills and only two losses. I wish we could see which units they killed though, as I'm curious how many of those were horse archers. Now these next results were shocking. Heavy spears killed 130 and only 16 losses, almost 10 to 1 KDR, against a cavalry heavy culture. The heavy axemen killed only 57 with 29 losses, not even 2 KDR. I think we'll know for sure once we fight the infantry heavy battalions. But first we must defeat the mighty Asurai in the south. I decided to push the limits a bit with around 850 versus 650 and a huge power disadvantage. The AI barely killed 230 out of the 850 so this should be interesting. The Asurai have some horse archers in their lineup so we'll use a similar strategy with the shield squares providing some cover for our archers and a counter charge from our own cavalry. They decide to run straight into our lines and then retreat. Then again run straight into our squares and stop. Anyhow time to push forward with the shields to burn their arrow supply. With the majority of their arrows burned, we approach slowly. The large hill provides a good defensive position for the enemy, but we proceed forward anyways. They send everything forward and we hold ground, choosing not to fight on the slope of the hill. Once their infantry are close enough, we give the charge command and wait for our imminent victory. Our line is stretched incredibly thin here, and since the enemy has 200 more troops than we do, they're able to outnumber us in flank. That certainly wasn't ideal, but I think I know where the mistakes happen. We outperform the AI by more than double at least. Let's run this one back. This time the enemy horse Horse archers are a bit smarter, choosing to circle around and flee properly. After a few more cycles, we move on to the main battle. There were two problems with the previous battle. We allowed the enemy to take the high ground, and we allowed our lines to stretch out way too thin. This time we flank to the nearby hill and come down after them, soaking arrows first before we engage. We're able to deal effectively with their cavalry and their infantry are frozen in fear on the hill. We use our reserve cavalry to shore up the flanks and repulse their cavalry. Not surprisingly, the AI reinforcements are coming from behind our troops and they they decide to walk right through our squares to get to their destination. Here comes another wave. Slam right into the back of our squares, so we set the archers in melee mode and charge in. Remember, much of winning melee battles is having greater numbers in the mix, so don't be afraid to use archers aggressively like this. They're still hesitant to engage, so we move our archers to the flank and attack. If they rush our archers, we push squares in. If they hold fast against the squares, they get picked off by archers. It's checkmate. Looks like they're down to recruit reinforcements at this point. We push them past the rock, but they refused to engage still, so I had the idea to back off and see if they would split into two groups, allowing us to defeat them in detail. Sure enough, they try to wrap around the rock, allowing us to pounce on their horrible formation. It's a complete slaughter, with half of their army falling before the other half even engage us. What a huge difference in results. 841 kills and only 317 losses. If we compare the two armies, the Asurai had a total of 5200 dinars worth of troops, while our army barely had 4000. With numbers like this, I was expecting big things from our heavies. 238 kills and 42 deaths for 5.6 KDR. It's in line with an infantry-based enemy even though Asurai are known for their skirmisher style cavalry. The heavy axemen came in at 136 kills and 21 losses or 6.4 KDR, which isn't all that great either compared to the other testing. After looking through these numbers, I think I found the reason. Our lower tier infantry really held their own. Nearly all of the tier 2 warriors had a KDR above 1, with some even being above 2. The overall infantry performance was 6 600 kills and 219 losses, or just under 3 KDR. 600 kills is roughly 70% of the entire army. Well done, boys. Archers came in at 213 with 82 losses, which is not great numbers to be honest. And once again, our cavalry did next to nothing. 25 kills and 15 losses. I would have rather have more infantry or archers instead. I decided to save the Batanians for last, as they proved to be the most formidable challenge. Not only do they have strong infantry, but their foot archers are unmatched and provide a real challenge for Sturgeons. The discrepancy in numbers isn't as large here, 500 versus 425, but make no mistake, this is a tough battle. And for the first time in this video, the enemy is pushing forward with everything they have. We maintain the square front line for now. Because our archers are behind our shield wall, they're trading effectively with superior enemy archers. Right before the infantry reach our line, 
line, and the enemy cavalry come crashing in from both flanks. It's about time we see a competent AI leading their troops. Now that the cavalry are stuck in, we can switch to shield wall charge. At first glance, it seems like we're winning handedly, but then the battle devolves into a messy slog. With mostly infantry left, we combine our troops into one square for protection. We hang on for dear life and come out on top in the end. What a nail biter. We survive with only 38 standing troops. 494 kills to the enemy's 386. Let's look at the data to see how we came out on top. Our total wages came to 2600 and we ended up with 1.27 KDR. The Petanians had a massive advantage here at 3400 total wages, but only managed a 0.78 KDR. Looking at the Petanian infantry, the problem is glaringly obvious. They have two units that shredded our infantry, the Oathsworn and the Falksmen. Nearly all groups of Oathsworn had a KDR north of 2.5, while the Falksmen were between 3.5 and 9. Ouch. These guys are beasts. The Batanian infantry overall ended up with a 0.8 KDR. Let's compare that with the Sturgeon infantry. Both of our heavies performed on par with the Oathsworn, ending up with between 2 and 3 KDR mostly, although the Spearmen came out on top this round. Overall, the infantry ended up around 1.23 KDR, which is still better than the Batanians. We won't spend a ton of time on the rest, but it's important to note that the Batanian archers were deadly, earning above 1.5 KDR. I would also like to note that many of their kills actually came from melee combat, since our shield wall took very few casualties during their volleys. Once again, our archers performed okay. Not great, but not bad, at 1.5 KDR. And finally, the real reason the Batanians lost this battle, their cavalry. They only killed 20 units, but lost 121 for a 0.17 KDR. They would have been better off with recruits instead of cavalry, as they usually end up around 0.4 KDR. And as usual, our cavalry was mostly a blocking force and added very little to the bottom line. Let's recap the important points and end with a few of my personal thoughts. Sturgia has long been considered the sick man of Calradia. They seem to lose every campaign. However, based on the results from these battles, it doesn't seem to be from their units. The shield squares and wall is very resilient to arrows. One thing I noticed, while in any shield wall formation, the best units are placed at the front with the weaker units in the center. Since these units have better shield coverage and stronger shields, they can absorb the damage well. The weaker units behind perform well as pure damage dealers as long as they weren't targeted first. So it's very important to have at least a small number of top tier shielded infantry in our ranks to help absorb damage and help the weaker ones survive long enough to dish out their damage. Having multiple shield squares spread widely helped against cavalry charges and incoming infantry alike. But once engaged against the main infantry force, they should be switched to shield wall and given the charge command. If the enemy is being passive, keep the shield wall at the very edge of the archer's range. This will minimize the damage their arrows do while also draining their ammunition. Cavalry are extremely weak in Bannerlord, and they should either be avoided altogether or be used as a reserve force, being able to easily reinforce parts of the line quickly. When our cavalry are engaged with enemy cavalry, be sure to switch to shield wall formation. When using our own archers, try to conserve ammunition for knocking out incoming cavalry or enemy archers. If the enemy cavalry does manage to reach our archers, give them the charge command until the enemy retreats. If the enemy has reinforcements coming and we've shattered their main force, do not give chase. Instead, pause to regroup and fight as one solid unit. Let's chat for a second about the testing here. I knew cavalry was weak, but I was surprised at how bad their numbers were overall. Even our tier 5 hardened brigands were useless compared to lower tier infantry and archers. Unfortunately, the AI didn't have any noble units on the Sturgeon side, so we couldn't test them out in battle. I was also disappointed to see how the AI was playing so passively while having a huge numbers advantage and force advantage. However, like Napoleon says, never interrupt the enemy when they're making a mistake. So we roll with it for now. Now that I've made a database that can automatically calculate calculate army wages, I would like to redo this video for Sturgia, but using custom battles instead. I wanted to use only noble parties to get a good representation of what real battles are like without the player's min-max army involved, but I felt like they had way too many low tier units, most likely because it was in the early stage of the game. Low tier infantry and archers performed reasonably well, but low tier cavalry, both melee and ranged, were a complete waste of space. For example, Vlandia and Kazate both had tier 2 and tier 3 cavalry that would consist consistently get 0 kills and 100% deaths, with 30 to 40 units of the same type. Higher tier cavalry are still not very good, but at least they do better than 0 kills. Oh, quick update, there was a patch today after I had already done all the work on this video, and it says apparently they had fixed cavalry melee. We'll see, I'll run some tests on it and let you know, but if you want to see why cavalry performs so well against other cavalry and shield wall formation, click this video right here. Thanks to all the channel members and Patreon supporters, you're the shield square to this channel, and I appreciate you. Taking favorable taking fa the right flank attacks ease oh come on